Hi everyone, uh, my name is Aman Dhamija and I'm a software engineer at Goldman Sachs. Um, and I am beyond thrilled to speak to you all today about um, the Green Software Foundation and green software itself. Um, and this is a topic that I'm really passionate about because I think it's great that there's something in my profession that I can do to help with the climate crisis. Um, and so um, Goldman Sachs is a member of the Green Software Foundation, which is how I got introduced to all of this. Um, and it's been quite a journey of learning and I'm very excited to share that with you all today. So let's get started. So uh, what is the Green Software Foundation? Well, it's a non-profit uh, under the Linux Foundation with the mission of building a trusted ecosystem of people, tooling, and best practices for green software. The foundation's vision uh, is to change the way um, that, um, you know, the culture of how we build software within the global tech industry. And um, we want to do it in such a way that sustainability becomes a core priority and is just as important as something such as cost, performance, accessibility, etc. And with net emissions increasing in the IT industry each year, it's very important to focus on reduction of carbon emissions, and we can only do that if we place software at the center of our sustainability discussion. But what is green software in the first place? Well, there are two ways of looking at software. Software as part of the climate solution and software as part of the climate problem. We want to see software as part of the climate solution and thereby we want to focus on reducing the carbon emissions from software itself. There are only three ways of doing this right now. Using lesser physical resources, using lesser energy and using energy more efficiently. And so essentially, green software is carbon efficient software, which means it uses the least amount of carbon possible. So how do we go about building green software then? Well, it's important to understand the three principles of green software and then put them into practice. So the principles are energy efficiency, hardware efficiency and carbon awareness. But before we do a deep dive into these principles, let's first understand the concept of carbon efficiency, which is at the core of all of these principles. Did you know that just one hour of streaming produces the same amount of carbon emissions as charging seven smartphones? And so for every gram of carbon that we emit into the atmosphere, we want to extract the maximum value possible. Therefore, carbon efficient applications okay, are those that emit the least hit. amount of carbon possible. And so our goal should always be to build carbon efficient applications. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our first principle, which is energy efficiency. Now, energy is the ability to do work and it exists in many forms. We can convert one form to the other as well. And so using that, we can consider energy to be a measure of the electricity that's being used. But is our electricity even clean? Well, most people think so, because whenever they plug something into the socket, their hands don't get dirty. However, most electricity is actually produced by burning fossil fuels, and thereby energy supply is one of the single biggest emitters of carbon. And so in this way, we can actually think of electricity as a proxy for carbon. And if our goal is to be carbon efficient, then we must be energy efficient. So let's take a look at how we can improve energy efficiency. A quick show of hands, how many of you never actually shut down your PC or your laptop when you're not using it? Okay. Well, let me try to convince you otherwise. Um, so let me introduce to you a concept called energy proportionality. And what this basically measures is the relationship between the amount of electricity that a device draws and the rate at which it does useful computing application. And you'll see that this relationship isn't exactly linear. So if you take a look at this diagram here, let's assume we have a device that at 0% utilization consumes 100 watt of power. 
When it reaches 50% utilization, it consumes 180 watt. And when it reaches 100%, it only consumes 200 watt. And so from this we can see that the more we utilize a device, the more efficiently we convert electricity into practical computing applications. And thereby we're improving energy efficiency. So coming to our second principle, we have carbon awareness in which we'll focus on using electricity more when it's clean. But how do we know if our electricity is clean or dirty and how do we measure it? Well, not all electricity is actually produced in the same way. Depending on your region or location, electricity is produced as a mixture of various sources and all of these sources have varying carbon emissions. So for example, if your sources include um, wind or solar, then um, the carbon emissions would be lesser. However, if your sources are um, fossil fuels, then that would be a lot of carbon emissions. And so let me introduce to you a term called carbon intensity, which basically measures the amount of carbon that's emitted in gram per kilowatt hour of electricity consumption. And if our goal is to build carbon efficient software, then that means we must use electricity when the carbon intensity is least. So carbon intensity varies by location, and this is because some regions have an energy mix in which the proportion of clean energy is much greater. Carbon intensity varies by time as well, and this is primarily due to the variable nature of renewables itself. So if you take a look at this graph here, we can see that even though the demand for electricity remains the same, the carbon intensity of the bar um, at the extreme end is much greater than the bar uh, at the start. And this is because at that point in time, the wind may have stopped blowing or the sun may have stopped shining, causing your power grid supplier to rely more on burning fossil fuels to produce that demand. And so this brings us to a concept called carbon-aware computing, which basically says, do more with your software when your carbon intensity is lesser. And this can be achieved by a concept called demand shifting, uh, which is possible if you have flexibility into where and when you can run your workload or your application. And so there are two ways of achieving demand shifting. The first one is, Spatial shifting, which basically means move your compute or your application to a different region where the carbon intensity is lesser. Secondly, we have temporal shifting, which means shift your compute or your application to a different time during the day such that the carbon intensity is lesser. And doing this not only reduces the carbon emissions from your software, but it also helps accelerate the transition to lower carbon sources of energy in the future. Coming to our third principle, we have hardware efficiency, in which we consider the hardware that's actually used to build and run our software. So, as um, Thibault mentioned in the talk previously, manufacturing actually has a major role to play in terms of carbon emissions. And so, um, essentially, every device that we come across, be it mobile phones, laptops, servers, they all cause carbon pollution during their creation and emission. And this is called the embodied carbon of a device. And it's actually a hidden cost when we think of building green software. So, to put things into perspective, for most end-user devices, the embodied carbon emissions are actually much greater than the lifetime emissions produced by consumption of electricity. So how do we go about improving hardware efficiency then? Well, it's actually quite simple. For end-user devices, it simply means extending the lifespan of your device. Whereas for cloud computing, it means um, in increasing your utilization. So let's take a look at a few examples. So let's assume your device has 1,000 kgs of embodied carbon and an expected lifespan of two years. That means you end up emitting 500 kgs of embodied carbon per year. However, if you were to just extend the lifespan of your device by one more year, 
the amount of carbon uh, embodied carbon emissions dropped down to 333 kgs per year and i really hope that this convinces you not to buy the latest model of your smartphone just yet with respect to utilization we can see from this example here that it's actually much better to run one server at 100% utilization rather than running five servers at 20% capacity so to do a quick recap the three principles of green software are energy efficiency which means using the least amount of energy possible hardware efficiency which means using the least amount of embodied carbon possible and carbon awareness which means doing more when electricity is clean and less when it's dirty so now that we've learned the three principles of green software it's important to actually apply them into practice when we are designing and building our application and when we actually apply a green software principle in practice it becomes a pattern so to give you an example whenever you're designing your application you should try to reduce the amount of data that's transmitted because from an energy efficiency point of view it's actually much better to transmit smaller sized data across the network um since it uses lesser electricity given that the network traffic is reduced and if you're interested in learning more such patterns um the green software foundation website has a catalog of patterns for various domains such as web cloud or ai so please explore that if you're interested so now that we've understood the three principles of green software how do we actually go about measuring the carbon emissions from our software and measuring is really really important because without that we can't validate our findings or you know we don't know how to improve so there are a couple of methods in today's world um the greenhouse gas protocol is by far uh, the most widely used method by organizations to calculate the total carbon emission um however a total doesn't actually tell us the complete story and so that's why the green software foundation came up with the software carbon intensity specification which calculates the rate of emissions from our software so let's quickly take a look at how the greenhouse gas protocol works well it asks you to bucket the emissions from your organization into three categories the first scope refers to direct emissions from an organization scope 2 refers to indirect emissions from purchased energy such as electricity or heat and scope 3 refers to all the um, indirect emissions from any other activity that an organization might do so to give you an example if you um, own a private cloud that means you own the servers on which your application is running and hence the carbon emissions from the energy consumed to run those applications would fall under scope 2 whereas the embodied carbon emissions of the servers itself would fall under scope 3 however it's actually not possible to calculate a complete and accurate total and why is that well to do so you would need uh, access to detailed data regarding um, your energy consumption um, carbon intensity and hardware specification and even if the scope of your software is entirely limited to your organization getting complete and accurate data regarding these features can be very challenging it's even more difficult when it comes to open source and that's because maintainers often don't have visibility into where and when their application or their software is being run and maintainers are from different organizations it's hard to understand whose responsibility it actually is to calculate this total So let me introduce to you the software carbon intensity specification which was created by the standards working group at the green software foundation and the SCI basically scores your application along the dimensions of sustainability and it incentivizes the reduction of carbon emissions so it basically asks you to bucket the uh, emissions from your software into two categories the first category is operational emissions and these are the carbon emissions that are arising from running your application the second category is embodied emissions which are the emissions from the hardware that's used to build and run your software 
So if we take a look at this equation on the screen, the first term E into I represents your um, energy, uh, represents your operational emissions, where E is the energy that's actually consumed uh, to run your software, and I is the location-based carbon intensity. M refers to the embodied emissions, and it's basically the embodied carbon um, that uh, is uh, that is coming from the hardware used to run your software. So essentially this equation just boils down to carbon per R, where R is called the functional unit and it defines how your software scales. So simply put, do you want to calculate the carbon per number of end users, do you want to calculate the carbon per number of API calls, or do you want to calculate the carbon per number of ML jobs? And so R is the core characteristic of this equation that turns it into an intensity rather than a total. So to round it all up, let's take a look at a case study whereby UBS and Microsoft partnered together to put into practice the concept of carbon-aware computing. So UBS has a core risk platform on which they run Azure batch workloads. And they wanted to see that um, if they time shifted these workloads to a different time slot during the day, would their carbon emissions come down? And the Green Software Foundation has a project called Carbon Aware SDK, which is basically an API and a command line tool that has the capability of telling you historical and uh, future carbon intensity data uh, for any compute that you run on Azure workload or infrastructure, given that you provide a location and a time period. So using this API, UBS first uh, calculated the carbon intensity um, of a workload that they had already processed in the past. This came out to be 719 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. Next, they wanted to find an optimal time slot during the day such that they could run their workload and um, the amount of carbon intensity would be the least. So they basically queried the Carbon Aware SDK API at an interval of five minutes during the day, and they found an optimal time slot such that the forecasted carbon intensity was 659 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. They then actually ran their workload during this uh, time slot, and the actual carbon intensity came out to be 642 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. And so using these three steps, they would basically identify an optimal time slot during which they could run their workload um, during the day, such that the carbon emissions would be the least. And essentially for the MVP solution, they only focused on a reduction in carbon intensity to determine a reduction in their carbon emissions. So this brings us to the end of my presentation, and I really hope that all of you have realized we can be part of the climate solution itself. And if the topics that I spoke about interested you, then the Green Software Foundation and the Linux Foundation have launched a course that can help you to build, run, and maintain greener applications. And you can find more details about this on the Green Software website. Um, thank you for listening to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.